Viva pessoal, o podcast de hoje é uma entrevista ao Tim Marshall, um dos maiores especialistas em todo o mundo sobre fronteiras e geopolítica, e vamos falar fundamentalmente acerca do seu último livro, chamado O Futuro da Geografia. Ora, e falar sobre o futuro da geografia é falar quase sobre ficção científica. Vamos falar sobre o interesse que as grandes potências têm no espaço, onde é que entra aí o papel dos satélites, das armas para destruir os satélites, as riquezas que se encontram no espaço e, e o que grandes, as grandes potências uh, estão dispostas a fazer para o obter, até grandes empresas particulares. Portanto, é uma conversa que, apesar de parecer política e geopolítica, tem aqui um, um ADN de ficção científica que encaixa que nem uma luva no Bankcast. São 40 minutos muito interessantes. Isto foi gravado ao vivo no Festival Bang. Pá, e espero que vocês gostem tanto desta conversa quanto eu gostei de participar nela. Um abraço e bom bancast. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. And congratulations for your latest book. We are publishing it in a couple of months, I think. I think it's... Uh, yeah. um, no. Congratulations. We are big fans of your work. And, and And not only us, but the Portuguese readers, your books... Uh, have sold very well for yes, our market, our and, and 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 in the beginning, I I, I have to be honest, I didn't mm, knew who you were, but in Frankfurt I saw the cover, and I fell in love with the cover, but then I thought this is geography, this is not <laughs> going to sell very well, but well let's give it a try, and then, well it was a bestseller in Portugal. Thank you. Um, I, forgive me for boasting, but yeah, bestseller in. Many countries, and um, I, again, I'm sorry to boast, but it, it, it's Prisoners of Geography has sold more than two million copies yes. around the world now. You were not expecting a, 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 a huge success. Like, you know. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. And the new one, you'll be pleased to know, the future of geography yes. today is uh, number five in the Sunday Times top ten. So I, I hope in Portugal it, it can do as well. We hope to. We, we, we really want it to work as well as the, the previous books. And the, 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 um, what you, you present in this book, um, we, we, we are in um, like a festival here, Festival Bank. Yes. It is a festival dedicated to the, to the, the fantastic, to, the, to science fiction, fantasy. I can see from the T-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> Superman and horror. And we thought that your book is like... It could be science fiction 20 years ago, but now it's, it's reality. So we thought, well, th this makes sense on this festival because although it is reality, this was science fiction uh, some years ago, and the, 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 the science fiction readers are very interested in, in your book, in, in all the, the subjects you, you explore. And what, what is science fiction, including in literature, often becomes science fact. Yeah. The idea of a satellite belt uh, w w was science fiction. It became fact. In Star Trek, when I was a child, Captain Kirk flipped open this thing and spoke to a thing in space. We do it, we do it, uh, where's my phone? It's gone. No, it's in my pocket. We do it every day now. Uh, uh, on, on this, and, yes. and yet in my own lifetime, this was completely science fiction. And when I do do a presentation on this book, um, I include a video of uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX, not just landing one rocket back down, but two at the same time. And you look at it, and to my generation, it looks like science fiction, but, but it's, it's, it's happening now. The last thing I'd say on that is that uh, there is a, a chapter a couple of chapters in the book, which does look ahead to things like space elevators, uh, to bases on the moon, and sadly to uh, potential conflict uh, on on, uh, on planets. Uh, so yeah, you know there is a little bit of science fiction yes. and science fact in it. I was reading your book, and uh, I think you are an optimist because you always speaks about the good things of the the space of the, this, this kind of mm -hmm. discovering of the space. Uh, and I will, would like to know what you, are you thinking are going to be the main discoveries of this game-changing in space? 
I am an optimist, um, partially because every generation always says, oh, it's the end of the world, the sky is falling, but it isn't, usually. I'm an optimist for many, many reasons, but it, when it comes to space, I understand the arguments about uh, uh, mental damage we do every time a rocket takes off. I mean, it, you know, big rockets, it's an Olympic swimming pool size worth of petrol going up. But this year, universe, uh, Caltech, uh, California Technology yes. Institute, they have a, a very small satellite, a cube, cube size, because now they're the size of Rubik's cubes, some of them. They have one. It has a solar panel on it. They have captured the sun's energy. If you remember, 84 hours a day there. There's no yes. day and night. They have transferred it into a microwave signal. They have sent it down directly to one dish because you can beam it to wherever you want and they have lit one light bulb one now i'm impressed with that because theoretically scale that into a whole uh, fleets of solar panels all beaming the energy down to exactly where it's required 24 hours a day unlike our solar panels here only work when it's sunny that is a, 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 a potentially a revolutionary moment that has happened just this year. I think we will go to the moon. Well, we're going to the moon in 2026. The Americans are going to walk on the moon. The Chinese want to base there 2032, so do the Americans, to mine the very minerals we need for the technology of the 21st century, the lithium, uh, silicon, etc. Two more, quickly. I do think we need a plan or a planet B in case something happens to this one. So A, we will lily pad from the moon to Mars. A lily pad meaning, you know, you like a, a frog, it jumps on the lily pad, then on the next one. But also, you've seen the film probably, Don't Look Up, the yeah. satire. And it is the scenario of a planet ending asteroid hitting us. Last year, we, humanity, we sent a, uh, a rocket, a fridge freezer, basically sized piece of metal. And we hit an asteroid, something like 3 million miles away. And we deflected it off course to test, can such a thing be done? And it can. If we don't put the work in now, if and when in 100 years an asteroid is coming and we, we haven't put the work in now to be able to deflect it, game over. So I think there's so many positives, but I'm aware of the negatives. But, but it's funny that you spoke about this movie, Don't Look Up. And in this movie, the, 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 the government is not aware of the threats of the meteorites. They, they, they neglect the, the scientists in the, in the movie. You remember the yes. movie? Yes. And yes. For me, that's the case. Do you think the, this kind of, uh, you speak that the race for the, the space is now a theme, but I don't think the, the governments are aware of that. Do you think so? They are aware of that? Because I, I see the movie and I don't think they are aware of the, the challenge um, and no, the opportunities. Well, the governments are very, very aware of that space is now an integral part of international relations. You cannot divorce international relations from space. You can't divorce your economy from space. Yes. You can't dif divorce your defense, your military from space. That is uh, the reason why we have a new space race. Yes. Um, it's driven more by economics this time, whereas before it was driven partially by ideology. Each side had to prove they were the better. But now they're going for commercial reasons to the moon, commercial reasons into the satellite belt, and military reasons. So the governments are very aware of this, and the governments are also using the satellites to measure the ocean temperatures to help us understand climate change. Uh, space is being used by governments for medical experiments, really good medical experiments to help us all. So I, I actually think that, that um, governments are very aware of the value of space. What they're less concerned about, and perhaps they should be, is getting the laws into place 
to deal with this new interest because we do not have the laws for the 21st century. We have the laws for the, the situation in 1967 when the Outer Space Treaty was signed. We have no new laws about lasers, how close one satellite can come to another, um, sovereignty uh, for a commercial entity uh, on the moon. I mean, the, the, the existing law says no one state have sovereignty in space. It doesn't say if Elon Musk, SpaceX, for example, there are many other countries, if they go and dig up some silicon out of the moon, if there's no sovereignty, who does it belong to? By what right can you sell it? We, we don't have these laws. Another example, the Japanese are working on satellites that will have big uh, hydraulic arms on them, which will grab hold of defunct satellites, throw them into the atmosphere to burn them up, because space debris is a massive problem that the governments are not dealing with either. But that's dual-use technology. If I have my nuclear early warning system in my satellite and your satellite is creeping up behind me, it's big arms, I'm getting very, very nervous. So uh, we need 21st century treaties, technologies, agreement, cleaning up space debris, and we're not really even approaching uh, the new laws. A little bit like AI. I'm sure your audience is interested in AI. Yes. Our laws are 50 years out of date. When it comes to AI, which will also have a big impact uh, on the space race, just now the politicians are beginning to wake up about legislation and artificial intelligence. By the time they have enacted one law, artificial intelligence will have raced ahead already. You know, they need to come and work fast. But, but don't you think that the political situation we are living now uh, it's not as peaceful as it was maybe 10 years ago. We have this problem with, with Russia, with yeah. China, with Taiwan. Uh, maybe Trump wins and is president again. If it's not Trump, maybe it's another guy similar to Trump. Do we have any chances of putting those laws, putting all, all the big powers talking, uh, like civilized people, but eventually, you're right. This is—I mean, this is why I wrote the book because um, the politics there mirror the politics here. The Americans have something called the Artemis Accords. The British are a signatory to them. So is India, France, Israel, UAE, Japan. About 28 countries, and so they are going up back to the moon, the new space station, the idea of getting to Mars as a block. So China, which is now absolutely the dominant force in the Chinese-Russian ship, they have a space relationship as well. They are going up as a block with Iran is trying to uh, work with them, a few other uh, authoritarian countries, North Korea. So we're going up as two blocks, which is dangerous because we should be going up as humanity, but that's perhaps uh, not naive, but wishful thinking. So what I suspect will happen is at the moment, it's the Klondike gold rush. I want to get to the moon first. Uh, I don't care about you. Um, I will do what I can, for example, with uh, super semiconductor chips to keep you a decade behind because China is about 10 years behind uh, the Dutch and the Americans on, um, on super semiconductor chips. But you, well, you don't remember. I don't know. I'm old and I don't remember. But the Americans got the nuclear weapon in 45, 1945. And then the Russian, the Soviets got it four or five years later. And they spent the next few years building as many nuclear weapons as they could until they each had tens of thousands. But at that point, they realized, we need to talk. We need to talk to each other about this. And I think that's been the case uh, if you looked at, uh, the British and the Germans before World War I and all the ships they built, they, they realized they needed to talk. Now, I know they did fight. We will go through the same process. We'll be racing to the moon. We'll be building space weapons. They are already being built. We will integrate more and more our satellites with our war fighting capabilities. And at some point, governments will realize, actually, we need to lower this. 
So we will go through a few years of turbulent times. They will then finally realize that we need a solid law or a post one satellite can be, site of clearing space debris, agreements not to dazzle satellites, not to send spoof information to them, and we will have our treaties. But in the meantime, it's a jungle. <laughs> you are being optimistic. Yes. I after think. all. But we have to uh, wait I'm years. looking at the lessons of history and drawing conclusions that um, history does not repeat itself. But Mark Twain said it rhymes. So it, we will recognize something that will look a little bit like the past. Okay. I hope so. We, and he wrote a sci-fi novel as well, by the way. Um, what was it? Um, um, uh, 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 something in Camelot. The King in Camelot Castle or something. That, that was uh, Mark Twain's one sci-fi novel looking into the future. Okay. Um, we are speaking about the, the governments and the space race, but now in the moment... We are watching uh, enterprises like SpaceX and others. They are uh, leaders of the race. Even in the war in Ukraine, uh, SpaceX yeah. had an important role. Uh, do you think that uh, will become a problem or an advantage? You are an optimistic. I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> but I, well, I need to what know is a what problem to one person that. is an advantage. Yeah. Yeah, my, my advantage, it might be your problem. Yes, yes um, maybe. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. You, you may know some of this, you probably, probably know some of this. Um, when the Russians threw the first set of missiles into Ukraine on February 24th last year, one of the first things they did was take out the, the ground stations for the internet in the Irpin region. Several hundred thousand people lost access to the internet, which in the 21st century is a big deal. Can't go on Twitter. Terrible. <laughs> um, actually, that's a blessing, but leave that to one side. So in comes SpaceX, and Musk flies in thousands and thousands of dishes, Starlink terminals, to receive the Starlink uh, internet service, which is a space only, and he put them back online within a few days. And now they can download Netflix. They can talk to their loved ones. They can organize refugees. But of course, the Ukrainian military jumped on it and used Starlink's satellite service to target Russian troops. Now, I'm not talking about the rights and the wrongs of that. I'm simply talking about the situation, which is a new situation in, in warfare. The Russians immediately began to dazzle Starlink's satellites. There's been a cat and mouse game. So the question is, is Starlink a legitimate military target for Russia or in any other similar situation? Is the satellite, is a commercial satellite system a legitimate military target? So he said, look, I only wanted it for the civilians. Let me fast forward now to this year. And we find out that a few months ago, The Ukrainians were going to send under, well, they sent underwater drones to Sebastopol to try and sink the Russian fleet. They didn't realize that Starlink's signal ended halfway across the Black Sea. They actually rang him up and said, Elon, can you switch it on all the way to the port? And he said, no way, because that's different to last year. That is actively making a decision to enable an attack. So I just use that as an example of uh, one person's advantage is another person's problem. But that, those are great examples for how we haven't thought these things through. We don't have solid um, laws. Your country, like mine, is a member of NATO. Last year, NATO updated uh, its articles, and it, went, it was agreed. I don't remember the exact language, but now it talks not just about an attack on or, or, or within a NATO country. The language talks about an attack from or above a NATO country. It doesn't stipulate how high. It doesn't leave, it, it leaves it open that what, what if the satellite that is attacked is over the Pacific, which is not over nobody's country, or what happens if it's over America, which is a NATO 
state. It's deliberately left that language loose in order to then be able to make the decision if and when this thing ever happens. That does trigger Article 5 and Portugal goes to war, or it doesn't trigger Article 5. They've deliberately left the language loose. But again, it's a very good example of how the technology is ahead of the law. I'm curious, uh, for, for the next, uh, this new generation of uh, exploration, uh, we, we are used to, to, to the governments to lead and to the, to the taxes to, to, to pay for all the developments. But now, uh, NASA is a little bit like NATO. It, it was brain dead. And then the, the, the new hmm. independent and uh, companies like SpaceX, uh, yeah. like uh, wake up, change everything. People were aware of space again and looking to the, the rockets again. Do you think the future will be mainly uh, in the hands of private companies or maybe... It depends according no, to the countries. You're absolutely right to bring up private companies uh, and in this context, because previously in the 60s and 70s in the Apollo moon, this to the moon, private enterprise in America, yes, it was involved, but this was NASA and US government driven. And that's the one of the biggest differences now. It's It's... Commercial companies are front and center. And in fact, without them, I, I'm not sure it would all be happening. So, for example, Musk is involved in the, the moonshot landings for 2026 and beyond. So is Jeff Bezos. I think they, are, they might be involved in the space station they're going to build and also getting them up there. And Toyota, for example, are busy uh, designing prototypes of big vehicles that will trundle around, that you can, which are um, not the 60s dune buggies with the open tops, but these will be sealed unit vehicles. All this stuff is happening, and I don't think it would be happening without the commercial enterprise. Um, Musk is the one who reckons he'll get to the, the, the Mars first. We'll see. Um, the mining companies are interested. Uh, the armament companies, are, of course, interested. So they're much, much more involved. But the only thing I, I would say that if I, people think that gives the private enterprise ultimate control. I don't think it does. If you want to take a plane off from JFK in New York, you better have a license. And who is here is the license? The United States government. If you want to take send a rocket up, you need a license from the government. So I think the state will maintain a degree of oversight, but but only a only a degree. Um, uh, I mean, Musk actually said he reckoned that if he'd switched on Starlink further, it might have gone against U.S. sanctions. And that was another restraining factor that, that his company headquartered in America would therefore have fallen foul of American law. So you can see how there's going to be these uh, constraints as the government struggle to, uh, to keep control. In the moment, we see like the space is more or less a no man land. And do you think... In the future, we are going. You are going to write a book that called "The Future of the Geography in Space" or "Or the Borders in Space," because I think it's going to be more well, or less not. like that. Hey, I'm not Nobody, sure. I'm... I, I expect that the space will be a threat, but I don't think so. Well, I'm not sure. I'll write any more books. We'll we'll, we'll see. Um... <laughs> I hope so. This does seem a good place to stop. But, I mean, behind your question, the, the, really, the word you used there was borders. And, and yeah, and that's the, yes, that's the point, isn't it? Um, I think it's inevitable. Um, it doesn't matter what your language is. I mean, look, there's, there's people on Earth, very well-meaning people, and they say there shouldn't be any borders on Earth. You know, the nation state, they, they shouldn't have a border. I understand that, that comes from the heart. It's fine. I think it's utterly, utterly naive. I think even if you did collapse every border, uh, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say in Portugal and Spain, where you meet at the sea uh, towards the bottom as we come round the Algarve. There's no borders, no Portuguese, no Spanish, we're just one people. And then 
somebody in a part of Spain wants to dismantle a nuclear power station and get rid of the, uh, the waste, and they say, I'll tell you what, we'll put it over there. And the people in what used to be Portugal say, no, you won't, and they will have an organizing committee. Or you want to go fishing, and you go a little bit further around the Algarve, and oh, it's a very nice fishing area here. But the people there say, oh, actually, this is our fish. And then you will immediately talk to each other and draw a line. You can fish here, we can fish there. There is no way that would not happen, or you'd fight. This is why borders exist. So I cannot see, and this, is, this has been the case ever since we stopped being hunter-gatherers. This has been the case for 12, uh, well, we began to stop being hunter-gatherers approximately 12,000 years ago. And immediately, everything that is precious to you is static. And there, you immediately build a wall around it. I don't like the fact that that's true. It just is true. I sometimes say to school children when, when uh, they say, oh, fences and walls, Trump's wall, they're terrible things. And I say, if you live in a house, go home tonight, knock on your neighbor's door and say you'd like to take the fence between the two of you in your back garden. And I go, oh, no, no, no because they like their fences and walls. Sorry, I'll come to space. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> so there we are on the moon. I've spent $4 billion getting there, finding where the silicon is, bringing all the equipment, and I've started to dig it up. And someone else just next to me and say, oh, fantastic, and starts digging. I don't think so. Which is why in the Artemis Accords, there is an, an article that says when you've done all that, you can declare a safety zone. Hello? Now, in English, safety begins with an S. So does the word sovereignty. It also begins with an S. And in this particular example, I'm not sure I see the difference. You've got a safety zone, which is this big for how long? Everything in it is yours. It's a border. So I think they will be inevitable. When the Chinese and the Americans have their bases, early 2030s on the moon, they will come to an agreement about how close perhaps they should be to each other, how far away should your landing zones be. These are borders. I don't care if you call them borders. They are, and they will be. And it has been that way for a long time. Now, hearing you, I'm thinking on a TV series, I don't know if it's from Apple, called uh, For All Mankind. Are you watching it? It's an alternative history where the space race never stopped and the Russians arrived to the moon first and then they start building space, <laughs> uh, moon bases. And uh, you, you, yeah. you know that, that show? I've, I've heard of it. You, you must forgive me. I'm a, I'm a Neanderthal um, and a troglodyte. That's why you like I, I, I Yes. Oh, very much so. <laughs> but I very rarely watch te television. Um, I, I don't really watch TV. Well, but, th but this, is know, show, read... this is a show. Yeah, I, I like the sound of it. You would love it because it's alternate yeah. history and it's a, this, about the space race and all the politics and the geopolitics and even North Korea goes to the moon and there's some moon bases there and there's war they, they bring weapons there the marines are there and things get out of control and it's so realistic and and, and intense and it's it's going to the third season i really recommend for all mankind it's Sounds an great. amazing show uh, i'm going to uh I'll send you an email. I'll send you an email with, with yeah. the links because I, I think it's 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 you. And okay, when you watch it, Thank you think you. this is made for me. Well, what I wanted to say about, about that is that that you, you're absolutely right. That does look, as we say in English, right up my street. Um, very much made for me. And sorry, your English is better than mine. I don't need to translate. No, it's not. Um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what what I love about sci-fi is that it is absolutely a blank canvas for ideas. And you can paint any ideas you want on them because you're not constrained by reality in a way. So um, th this is why I think it's such a fabulous genre. I mean, some people think it's very geeky. Well, maybe it is. 
But at, at its root, science fiction is, is about ideas and it allows you to explore all, all sorts of ideas without the constraints that you would have uh, in, in other fiction writing. And, and I, I, again, it, I go back to Star Trek. Um, I know it was kitsch, the 60s one. I'll give you a great example of, of ideas and how it can expand your mind. They go down to a planet. They're walking around on this glittery sand. They scoop some up, take it back to the Enterprise, the uh, course, eventually the little bits of sand take over the ship, come onto the communication system and say, ugly bags of water, why are you trying to hurt us? So there's two things going on there. One, ugly bags of water, what a sensationally good description of us, perhaps. But B, our concept of life and intelligence, it just immediately challenges that, that you know, theoretically, I, I, I don't believe that life has to be carbon-based. I think that's a, a paucity, a, a not very much imagination. So this kitsch 1960s TV series throws up two brilliant, brilliant, essentially philosophical uh, ideas. So I've all, as you can tell, I've always been into this sort of thing. And, and the opportunity to write a book where, although it's essentially a book about international relations, but be able to draw some of that in was, a, was well, I was going to say it's a pleasure. I cry most of the time when I'm writing, because it, but no, it was a pleasure. And uh, you remember, of course you, you do, a couple of months ago when the, 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 the Americans start shooting Chinese balloons and mm. people... What's happening? Uh, did someone, some people were making fun of it. Nobody understood exactly what happened. What did happen, Tim? Well, okay. Firstly, people made fun because they don't understand intelligence and intelligence gathering. The Chinese said that this balloon, which had a, some very good cameras looking that way on it, and it had equipment to transmit those pictures to a satellite, which undoubtedly would downlink them to Beijing. Chinese said, oh, it was, the, it was the winds. They blew it off course. It just happened to stop and hover over an American nuclear base for two hours. So people are saying, well, so what? Well, intelligence. If at that low level you are getting fantastic quality and you work out the shift change, how many people are leaving? How many people are going in? Which are the buildings that are most people going into. You've learned something pretty useful there. One small picture in a 4,000-piece jigsaw. You then follow them home, a few of them, and you then find out agents on the ground, ah, that one's an alcoholic, and that one's having an extramarital affair. You're in. That's how intelligence works. So it's not just some silly joke of a silly balloon. It's part of a big picture. Look, the Americans do this as well, don't, don't get me wrong. That's the first thing. So they'd rather have kept it quiet, but TV looked at it and saw it, it became a big story, they had to act. They waited till it got over the sea so they could shoot it down uh, safely because there's a lot of metal on that. But I was thinking about this, this story and I came up with a scenario in the future, well, let's say they've sent a crude one, a, a one with a, a, a people in it. Such a thing is possible. And unbeknownst to the Chinese, while it's over, it's actually over at a time when something essential to American security is taking place. And the Americans have got 60 seconds to make a decision on whether to including the people in it before it transmits to the satellite. These are the new scenarios which uh, we haven't thought through but that's what the chinese were doing with the with the spy balloon um because it was a balloon it's considered to be a bit of a joke a joke spy cranes do you know 90 percent of the cranes in the docks and ports in america are made in china now i'm not saying that every single one of them has got spy microchips in them i i don't know but I'm saying that if I wanted to, I would put them in all those cranes. And then I would know back in Beijing exactly the volume 
of trade and what which trade was going in and out of America every day. This is how intelligence works. It's not always James Bond. And uh, leaving the future of geography a little bit for a moment, um, maybe I'm jumping to your first book. Why did Putin attack Ukraine, Tim? Uh, I know it's not space, but we are living oh, yeah. one year and a half of war. <laughs> Why did he do it? And what do you think will happen? Because okay. he's a bad man. That's one reason. Because he runs a gangster state. Two reasons. But there's other reasons. And the other reasons are important to understand because it makes you understand how he can bring a lot of the Russian population with him. And that's geography, sure. Now, look, there are reasons of um, the, the natural resources of Ukraine. There are deeply nationalistic re reasons that you genuinely feel this is part of Mother Russia, with just a slightly different language and, and some many Russian speakers, so it should be in the motherland. True, well, that's true from their perspective. Uh, it's true that it's a bit embarrassing if you have a flourishing, fledgling democracy very corrupt, but fledgling democracy next door, especially if its economy goes well, makes you look really bad. All these reasons are reasons. Then there's geography. 11 time zones, the top of the country where some, most of the ports are, a couple of them freeze. All of them have to go through the ice pack in the winter to get out to the sea lanes of the world. Your only warm water port is in Crimea, Sebastopol, but you only have it on lease, from which you think you will control forever until you don't control it. You think, oh, there's only 30 years left on this lease. These guys might be in NATO by then. We haven't got a port. You act. Second, North European plane starts in France, and it's flat all the way across through Poland into uh, Belarus, and then opens up into flat land in front of St. Petersburg and Moscow. The narrowest point of it is between the Baltic Sea and where the Carpathian Mountains start, and it's called Poland. So if you're going to go into Russia, you go through that gap. It's 300 miles wide. The Swedes have invaded through that gap. So have the Poles. So have did Napoleon in 1812, the Germans in 1914, the Germans in 1941. So if you have that history and that geography, you will be alarmed and you will seek to plug the gap to occupy Poland or control it, or plan B, we can't do either of those things because communism has collapsed and every single one of the Eastern European countries decided we want nothing to do with you and everything to do with you. Plan B, the flatland of Belarus and Ukraine. Great, we control it, not a problem. And then suddenly we don't control it. So they invaded to take at least a small buffer zone, away with it, 2011, You come back, 2022, for the second bite for the whole thing. And to their surprise, it hasn't worked. I think if the peace deal, as and when it comes, is not a really, really good peace deal, uh, they'll come back again in five years. And it will go through the whole thing again. So um, that's why every night, state-controlled TV in Russia can tell the Russian people, we are threatened, we are the noble ones, we have done the right thing, They are aggressing us, and because of that history and geography, a proportion of the Russian people will, will agree with it. That's why he invaded. And do you see any solution in the this year, next year? Yes. Oh, no, no, not this year. <laughs> But a solution. You know, your politician, all politicians, they always end up at some point in their lives saying, There is no military solution to this conflict. It's absolutely rubbish. No military solution. That side wins. Well, that's, that's a solution. You didn't get Joseph Stalin ringing up Hitler in 1945 at the gates of Berlin and saying, Adolf, there's no military solution to this. It's, it's just a nonsense. It's a platitude that politicians talk about. What they mean is we'd like peace, and that's a good thing. So not this year. They have to continue to utterly exhaust themselves. And when they have hurt enough, and again, I, I'm not trying to be on one side or the other, although I am on one of the sides. 
I'm just simply trying to explain. Um, when they, it's called mutually hurting exhaustion in English diplomacy. When they are both mutually exhausted and hurt enough, they'll come to the table. When that is, I don't know. But what I do know is there is no way it's ending this year. Because as you mentioned, Mr. Trump, Mr. Putin is absolutely waiting for Mr. Trump to be re-elected. They then pull the rug from underneath President Zelensky. Other countries, possibly yours, almost certainly Hungary, possibly Germany, France, Slovakia, maybe Italy. They all say, oh, well, if the Americans aren't going to support them, we have to stop now, so do the deal. And you'll be left with the British, the Poles, the Czechs, and the Baltic states. And that's not enough to sustain Ukraine. At that point, they must go to the table or lose. And it's Putin's in the strong position. That's what he's waiting for. I'm not saying Trump's going to win. I'm not saying that's what would happen. But I'm absolutely sure Trump is waiting on that time and no other. Okay, Tim. Thank you so much for this conversation. I know we started with space. We ended with uh, the current news and this yeah. terrible war. But we had to ask you, because every day in our televisions, we, th we see the, watch the generals and the c people commenting. And I think you did a, a very um, intelligent, intelligent uh, resume of why it happened and okay. what will happen in the, in the, in the future. And it's, it's terrible. Uh, we were not expecting yeah. this uh, at all. Uh, maybe maybe you, you were, but not, not, not me for sure. So thank you so much, Tim. Uh, best of luck. Thank you. The, Thanks for the invitation. Best thank, of, you. thank you so much. Best of luck with the book. And uh, I hope it's a success in Portugal. And let, let us know when you drive all I around the peninsula. I hope to see you in Porto. In Porto. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Obrigado. <laughs> to take Obrigado. you out Obrigado. to dinner. Okay. okay thank bye. you, Tim. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.